Hey, what's going on, Giants fans? Welcome to the latest episode of our Talk is Cheap podcast. Daryl Slater here with Bob Brookover from NJ Advanced Media, Star Ledger, NJ.com. It is uh, late Tuesday morning right now, and we are uh, rubbing the sleep out of our eyes, as many of you are, and trying to process and digest uh, what just happened Monday night uh, at MetLife Stadium. The Giants, uh, once again, a complete disaster, this time against the Seahawks, losing 24-3. Another primetime dud for Brian Dable's team, which has lost 40 to nothing to the Cowboys in week one at home in primetime. Uh, then the miracle comeback in Arizona, uh, where they were terrible in the first half. Um, and the Thursday night dud in San Francisco, which you can, can I could understand, you know, 30 to 12 on that one. And then an egg laying in an inexcusable one at that Monday night, 24 3 loss to Seattle at home and just uh this team is floundering in a big way they've played seven bad halves this year one great half and they are heading to miami this week then buffalo and this thing is really starting to spiral bob uh they're staring at one and five daryl uh you know i you know as i sit here might as well look forward because looking back uh not a fun thing for giants fans right now but looking forward Ain't so much fun either when you got the Dolphins in Miami coming off a horrible loss themselves to the to the Bills, so you know they're going to be um, chomping at the bit to get back on the field and getting a shot at a Giants team that um, that right now might be the worst in the NFL with the way they played so far. You could you could make a case for it, and then they have to go play those Bills in Buffalo on a Sunday night, and we've seen how they. Uh, perform in prime time so far this season that hasn't been pretty um yeah it's it's a hot mess it is it is indeed and the Giants have made some some really dubious history for the most part this year week one their worst home loss since 1943 then they turn around in week two and pull off what you know tied for their biggest comeback ever in franchise history in the biggest since 49 1949 I think then of course Week three, they go to San Francisco, and their offense was so bad, uh, 150 yards gained, which was tied for their fewest since 2006. Uh, and then last night, some more kind of history in a dubious fashion. They give up 11 sacks, 10 on Daniel Jones, uh, and that is the second most in recorded NFL history, which goes back to 1960, and the most is 12. So they were one-off tying the known record. Um so and then of course the first half stuff. I think the they seventy seven to nine. Yeah, yeah, seventy seven to nine after a fourteen three margin. Third, third uh, biggest, third biggest first half yep. uh, differential. Uh, first half differential after four games in history. <laughs> yep, since the merger in nineteen seventy, and um, yeah, I mean a fourteen three halftime margin, not as bad as some of the ones they had. They came in down sixty three to six at halftime. Now it's seventy. You know, you know what? You know what? And I don't want to rehash too much last week. Well, I, last night's game probably is worth rehashing for all the ineptitude that was involved. But but what what made that fourteen to three so bad last night was that Drew Locke came on the field yeah. and, and and led the led the Seahawks down the field to put get put that field that touchdown. You know, um, Dexter Lawrence was talking after the game last night about how the defense and and Brian Dable said the same thing about how the defense did some good things and they did. You know, they they kept playing. They were only responsible for giving up seventeen of the the twenty four points, which is you know, uh, Jim Johnson, the old Eagles, the late Eagles defense coordinator, should say you give up seventeen, you should win. That's the that's the magic was the magic number for him, but. You give up that touchdown when Drew Locke is on the field, and you got a chance to. You just got a field goal to get within four points, and you got a chance to get the ball back before the half and really give your offense some some momentum, your team some momentum, and you let that happen. So that to me was an inexcusable sequence in the game too. Yeah, uh, the Giants now their defense allowed sixty four points in the first half uh, this year because you, you take out the uh, thirteen non defensive points allowed in, in the Cowboys, and of course last night Daniel Jones hands directly seven points to Seattle, really 14 if you count that fumble. Um, yeah, but that, that fumble on the offensive line more than him. Yeah, he was under pressure. I mean, all he, and um, that, that, that play more so than any other. I mean, he, he ducked inside to get away from the pressure and then came back out and only to find two more guys coming on 
on his tail. I mean, it was, you know, there was no escaping that, I don't think. So coming out of Monday night, Daniel Jones now 1-12 in, in primetime games, the only win being that uh, one in Washington last year, which was so enormous. And the Giants have led for just 19 seconds all year, uh, that being at the end of the Arizona game. They have yet to run an offensive play uh, where they have had the lead. Uh, so uh, there's just so many uh, ways to uh, quantify so, how remarkably saw, bad they've been. I saw a stat driving home last night. Flash on my phone from I guess it was I think it was next gen. It was an ESPN stat that the Giants and the Jets are the only two teams in the NFL that have not run a play in the first half this season with a lead. <laughs> That's the, period. I think. Well, the Jets have they had it? They haven't had period. I'm not even the first half. The Giants have not run an offensive play period all year with a lead, and the same I believe is true for the Jets because they won. Okay, uh, they beat so, the Bills on a, at the end of the game. All right, I, I was reading it while I was driving, so so I may have misread it. That's that's just unbelievable. It is. It it defies comprehension. It defies logic. Like so much of this very disappointing giant season so far, and now they are facing a significant uphill climb. Uh, If you just try to wrap your head around it and think, okay, they probably need to go nine and eight to be in the playoff conversation. That means having to close. If if you just do the math, um, what eight wins and eight eight and five. Um, because they're one and three right now. So are is there eight and five ahead of this team, given the schedule that's ahead? Well, the next two weeks could be ugly if they don't find a way to get this thing going and to find a way to beat an actual good team, which is something they've rarely done under Brian Dable. Um, even last season while going nine, seven, and one, and really 10, eight, and one, if you count the one and one of the playoffs, they didn't really beat good teams. I mean, they beat the Vikings, they beat the Ravens. Um, there was one other one in there, uh, but this is a team that needed to take the next step this year. And man, have they not only not taken the next step, they've fallen flat in their faces. They they absolutely have. I mean, and it, there's just so many things, you know, there's been in that play, bad luck in terms of injuries, I think, especially on, along the offensive line, um, you know, and bad decisions in terms of uh, drafting and free agency that have also, that, you know, led to this, that, you know, they, they just, nothing they've done uh, since, since that playoff win against Minnesota last year has been good, really. I mean, very, very little has been good. And they're starting to see the manifestation of some of the bad decisions they made last year too. And we'll, we'll get to that, especially with the offensive line. And I guess that's a good place to start here. Um, yeah. We, I mean, we can pin a lot on Brian Dable who has to fix this mess and he has a quite a bit of dysfunction on his hands. Um, and he has a quarterback who's searching and and really not, you know, not playing well, but also not getting a lot of help from his offensive line. So we'll start there with this line. Obviously no Andrew Thomas last night uh, got hurt in week one, trying to chase down the block field goal. And then, I mean, uh, Thomas McGahey is, is very much on the hot seat. And quite frankly, it's not like he did a lot leading into this year. If you look at their PFF ratings and special teams, they were not, it did not inspire. Uh, it was not inspiring. All right. So and now they've been a complete mess in special teams and they had a block field goal that cost them. their one of their best players, period, on either side of the ball. And Andrew Thomas, who was chasing down uh, whoever it was that was returning that hurts his hamstring. Now missed three games. He had a setback. Essentially, last week, he talked about it in the locker room. Afterwards, he tweaked his hammy last week. Uh, so, uh Jeez. I mean, like Josh Azudu, they drafted him to be a guard last year in the third round, and it, the jury's still out on whether he can be a competent guard, but we know he definitely cannot be a competent left tackle. And the problem, too, is that Matt Parrott was drafted by the previous regime, and they, they don't even want to put him in the field. He's he's so bad. So the Giants last night go with Azudu over Tom, the injured Thomas at left tackle. They start the game, of course, with the going the rest of the way. Bredesen, Schmitz, McKeithen, Neal. Okay. Sure. Then then on the tush push play, Schmitz hurts his shoulder. They have to slide Bredis into center. They play Shane Lemieux at left guard, who is just, you know, doesn't have it. And then the then then the lingering issues too with the fact that the number seven overall pick last year, Evan Neal, has just continues to careen toward bust status. And so that's where this offensive line is at, um, in a bad place. Yeah, and you know, I if Evan Neal, I mean not Evan Neal, if, if Andrew Thomas doesn't come back this week, there's there's just no way they can beat the, the Dolphins. Uh, you know, and and really, it, it 
seems it's very iffy that he's going to be back. You know, it seems like you, you said he had the setback. It happened late in the week. Um, you know, in, in retrospect, I, I almost it's one of those things, you know, how you talk to a player and he says something and it doesn't register immediately. And then something happens. You're like, I should have recognized where he was at when he said it. And that and I'm going back to like last Tuesday when they had like the walkthrough practice with the long week. Um, and, you know, he, he was asked, are you, you know, how are you feeling? And he's like, uh, OK, but, you know, you won't really know until you get out there and run around. And the way he said it, like the, the plates went off my head that, hey, this guy, when thinking about it in hindsight, was, you know, he wasn't he was pretty sure then that things weren't going the way he had hoped in terms of recovering from this thing. And when he's out, I mean, think about the inexperience on that offensive line. You got a left yeah. tackle, who hadn't played left tackle at all before three games ago when he, when Thomas went out, you got a, a, a left guard and Bredesen was, you know, he's really your most experienced lineman. Um, but, you know, he really was a spot starter last season, never really been a starter. You got a rookie center and now he's hurt. Uh, you, you you have you brought in a rookie right guard. Uh, really, he's essentially a rookie. McKeith, and he had never played before this year. Uh, and you replace Polinsky with him, and then you have a right tackle who's in his second year and has yet to, as you you just said, has yet to really establish himself in any way other than being a big giant question mark. Um, you know, it's it's a, a bad situation and I don't know how, how it gets better. It gets a little better when, when Andrew Thomas does finally come back, it will get better some, but not to the point where you say, Oh yeah, now I got all the confidence in the world, in this offensive line. A hundred percent. And yeah, I mean, even going into this year, if they were fully healthy on the line and we said it like Andrew Thomas, there's not a lot of questions about him, but there are significant questions that every, about every single other offensive lineman they have and not just backups not just like Shane Lemieux. We are talking about like the rest of the guys and most especially Andrew Thomas. So broadly, you know, Daniel Jones, 50 dropbacks last night. He was pressured on 23 of those dropbacks. That's a 46% pressure rate, which is uh, right in line with the 47 rate he had coming into the game. So that's just an untenable number. I mean, he was pressured, yeah, 23 times on 50 dropbacks, which is bonkers. Now, if you go to PFF, they, they have their grades out. They put 19 of those pressures on the pass blocking and four of the sacks on the pass blocking. So I guess what they're saying is like six, maybe these grades aren't complete yet, but six of the sacks on Daniel Jones. I, I don't know. Don't focus too much on, on the total numbers, but if you look especially at who were the biggest culprits last night, Evan Neal gave up seven pressures. Josh Marcus McKeithen gave up four plus including a sack. Josh Azudu, four pressures allowed three sacks allowed this according to pff uh so right there are the guys who between the three of those guys 15 pressures allowed out of the 19 that were pinned on the pass blocking uh i i guess they're saying maybe one pressure was on was on jones or something like that but either way uh that just underscores how bad they've been how bad they've been how bad they were and in the locker room afterwards josh azudu who is an in, in uh, well Maybe they put four pressures on Jones since 19, whatever. Uh, Josh Azudu, an earnest kid, really wants to do well. Third round pick last year. It has not worked out so far, largely, at least this year, because he's playing in a spot that he doesn't really, he can't really play, uh, was in tears in the locker room afterwards. Teammates consoling him, encouraging him, offering him pointers. And it was a, it was a, a tough scene for him uh, as he slowly took his uniform off, cut the tape off his ankles and was his eyes welling with tears. And um, so that's really an image that just highlights where the Giants offensive line is at right now. Yeah, it really, it really encapsulated, it really encapsulated the whole night, just him sitting there. And it was, it was really hard to watch uh, him sitting there and just, you know, it, it tells you he's a guy who cares. You know, I, I often read, read things from fans like these guys just don't even care they care <laughs> trust me they care um you know uh and and Josh Azudu epitomized that last night how much he actually really did care by the, the way he reacted to what happened in that game um it, it was it was hard to look at you know to 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 
you know, see a guy expose himself that much to uh, how how badly things are going. Um, so, you know, um, Glowinski was the guy, first guy to go up to him, and he really spent a long time uh, with him. Um, so, but it's, it's entirely possible he's out there again on Sunday when they play the Dolphins. For sure. And as we're talking here, the news coming out uh, that the Giants are signing Justin Pugh to their practice squad. Um, obviously, guard, uh, not just depth, but a guy who can who can start, who has a starting track record. He's played for the Giants, started, obviously, for them. Um, and so you have to wonder here, they're not they're not signing him to stick him on the practice squad for the whole year. Um, it'll be interesting to see how he factors in. Yeah, I mean, uh, did, did you cover him? I don't remember if you had covered him. Or I did not, no. Okay. Uh, I, I thought he predated you, but, I mean, he obviously has an interesting history here. I think I thought you covered him because you wrote an interesting story about him, I guess, after he left the Giants that I that I had read uh, just about um, how distraught he was after a game. Uh, <laughs> so that it's interesting that he's coming in after we watched Josh Azuzu be that distraught after a game. Um, Eagles game, correct? Is that is that right? I can't remember exactly what that was, but that sounds right. Yeah, yeah. You you wrote about how distraught he was after an Eagles game, and it sent him into a bit of a depression. Um, you know, so these guys, you know, it th- th- does prove he cares. But a veteran presence in this locker room among the offensive linemen, uh, I, I would think would be welcome. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, there's been some insinuation that from from some players from that you know the Giants missed John Feliciano a little bit because he was a stabilizing uh veteran force last year. You know, Andrew Thomas is a veteran, but he's a quiet veteran. Um, you know, he's not like a vocal leader type of guy. Um, and they really don't have that on the offensive line this year. Um so getting maybe a guy like Justin Pugh in there, not a bad idea. 119 starts for Justin Pugh since he was drafted 19th overall in 2013 by the Giants. He played for them through uh, through 2017 and uh, then was in Arizona from 18 through 22. So he is coming off. Um, I guess he tore his ACL. Let me let me look that up as we're as we're talking here. Um, he did suffer a torn ACL in week six last year, uh, and so. That was what middle of October, and so he's back now, obviously, and, and healthy enough to rejoin the Giants. An interesting story: a guy who is 33 years old just turned 33 in August, and so you know he doesn't have a long career left, but he maybe can be a band aid for this team this year. Um, and we don't uh, let, let, let's just real quick, and we'll switch to the defense after this. Uh, because I do have to hop off and write, write about Justin Pugh, but we'll talk for a few more minutes here, give you a pick. I just wanted to, as we bottom line this offense, obviously the Andrew Thomas, the left tackle, drafted by the previous regime, has been great. Matt Parrott, drafted by the previous regime, not good enough to get on the field. You move inside to guard. Uh, ben Bredesen has been pretty good. He was traded for by the previous regime. Uh, Josh Azudu, third-round pick last year by Joe Shane, hasn't worked out. Uh, Shane Lemieux hasn't worked out, was a pre- previous regime guy, a fifth round pick. John Michael Schmitz will see the jury's out, obviously, second round pick this year. Marcus McKeithen was what, a fifth or sixth round pick. So you don't, you're not banking on a guy like that. But the reason he's in the game is because Mark Lewinsky, who they signed, Joe Shane signed last year, hasn't worked out for them. So that's a miss. And then, of course, the big miss, uh, and I don't think I'm missing anyone here. We'll get Evan Neal here last, but. Is Evan Neal, seventh overall pick last year. We've we've just said it. He's careening toward bus status. Uh anyone I missed there? Because it just underscores that Joe Shane has not done a great job of addressing an offensive line that needed addressing because his predecessor did so poorly at addressing it, right? Yeah, I mean, I, absolutely. Um, you know, it's it's a mess. It was a it was a mess when he got here, and it's not a it's not been fixed. And you know, some of it is the Andrew Thomas thing, but you know, some of it is the the, the moving parts, and you know you're, you're supposed to. It's it's a young offensive line. Um, that there's absolutely truth, but there's no signs that it's a young offensive line um, ascending. It's just a, it's just a young offensive line. <laughs> 
Very true. And, you know, look, I we're killing Shane Lemieux here, but he actually had a 79-8 pass blocking grade last night. He was their best pass blocker. Glowinski played, uh, um, if I'm reading this right, he, he came in and played left guard. Uh, am I looking at the wrong game here? Um, yeah, because. Yeah, he he came in and played uh, twenty snaps. Yeah, he well twenty pass blocking snaps. He came in and played. They got him at left guard. Uh, he must have come in at, for Lemieux when we were writing, but whatever. He played fairly decently. Anyway, the point remains. Setting aside the minutia of what happened in the game, obviously it was a disaster, and they've done a poor job of building the line. Um, look, you know, defensively, they really. They didn't allow 24 points, right? So they probably allowed 10-ish because they had a seven-yard touchdown drive Seattle did, and then the pick six. So that's 24 points and then 14 really given up by Daniel Jones and the offense and the line. Uh, One thing I think that could be a concern is you look at how Deontay Banks did against DK Metcalf. Not terrible. PFFs got him for Metcalf being targeted four times with Banks on him. Three catches, 34 yards. One of those, the one that was an incompletion was Metcalf actually went out of bounds. And he did make an awesome catch, but he he went out of bounds. So right. it was an incomplete pass. So Banks got getting a 57-7 coverage grade. So he gets perhaps Tyreek Hill this week, which my goodness. Um, I don't know. What do you what do you make of that defensive performance? Because it does come with a little bit of an asterisk because they the offense handed Seattle 14 points. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it was a – they had some good moments. I mean, they got off the field on fourth and one. And when it looked like the Giants were going to get back in the game, they got off the field on fourth and one. Michael McFadden did a pretty good job breaking up a pass on fourth and one. Um, and then the Giants go right down the field, and they have faced their own fourth and one. And Jones scrambles, picks up 10 yards, and put him at first and goal. Um you know, so it, it looked like, hey, things, you know, it, it, things haven't gone very well here. It's 14 to three, but they're about to to get back in the game, um, you know, and from, you know, second half row, they gave up three points in the second half, seven in the or, uh, you know, r- really seven because the Giants, the, the the fumble left the Giants was such a for- short field. The defense was such a short field. Um, but, you know, th- th- there's definitely questions. I mean, <laughs> One of the things that went unnoticed in the game uh, because it, you know, it had so many other things happened, but it, right from the beginning, they, they benched Trey Hawkins. Um, yes. The other, the other rookie cornerback made a Dory, uh, the, the out, permitted outside guy and inserted Cordell Flott um, at um, uh, this in a slot. So, you know, that, that tells you right there, they, they had, concerns about what was happening uh, I talked to Jerome Henderson on Saturday when they made the assistance available and you know he'd said he they had concerns about uh, Hawkins tackling in the San Francisco game uh you know oh, yeah. there, there were there were there were lots of guys to have tackling concerns about in that game uh, but you know they they made they made the choice to make to make that change uh it'll be interesting to see how they handle that going forward um you know, but I, I, you know, there's, there's still lots of question marks with defense and let's see, um, let's see what the defense does on Sunday against one of the more high powered, if not the most high powered offense in the NFL. And uh, yeah, I mean, that, that about sums it up and we'll get to a pick in a minute because we'll keep this nice and short and tight here, but uh, I wanted to just real quick on special teams. My goodness. I mean, they had six penalties in special teams. I'll go through it here. Now Gary Brightwell had two. Um, these guys all had one each Carter Coughlin, Cam Brown, Brown, Isaiah Simmons, and Casey Kreider, the long snapper. So you're talking about key special teams players there, six penalties in special teams, Eric Gray muffs a punt and they put a Dory Jackson in there and, and he actually didn't get hurt this time, but that's obviously a huge risk. They don't want to be putting him out there. Uh, Again, like I would not be surprised if Thomas McGahee has shown the door after this season. He's a guy who's been here through, I think this is his third regime, but you're not, you're just not seeing the special teams give the Giants the help they need. And last night was an, just an unmitigated disaster on that front. Yeah. And I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, not necessarily defend Thomas McGahee, but, but, um, uh, point out that, you know, the Giants just kind of acted like, hey, we can put anybody we want back, a punt returner. It doesn't really matter if they yeah. 
did it in college. And, you know, they they have guys who did it in college. Khalil Pimpleton comes to mind. who's was on the practice squad. Um, you know, but they they didn't they don't really seem to value that at all. Um and again, I I live I live in a place where I can get both Giants, Jets, and Eagles, all, all three teams. And I watched the Eagles on su- Sunday, and they they, they they signed this kid as an undrafted free agent, Britton Co- Covey, uh, last year, I believe. Um, and he's, you know, he's become the at, at the moment he leads the NFL in return yards, punt return yards, nine nine punt returns for 151 yards. And he's given the Eagles momentum in some games, whereas, you know, with the Giants, the punt return, it's almost like, well, if you don't mess it up, it's been a good play. Uh, And, you know, and Eric Gray was not a great punt returner in college. You know, he wasn't a great returner in college. Um, To me, that that's a that's a valuable position because a, a big a big special teams play, especially a punt return, kick returns have almost become obsolete in the NFL. Uh, but but pump returns, you get a big pump return and just you know change the field. It's a it's a momentum changing play. Uh, and the Giants, they you know they just didn't seem to value it um, in terms of when they put the roster together, personnel wise. You know, and, yeah. and, and last night we saw Dory Jackson go back there. We know how that turned out last year. Uh, Almost ruined but, their season. Right, right. So I mean, it's like. Uh, I think they should have addressed that 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 position a little uh, better than they did. The Giants have a ton to figure out here in all three phases. And, um, yeah, that's all you can say. And I guess we'll, we'll end it here. We'll keep this to about a half hour or so. But we'll end it here with a pick. Uh, Giants. Uh, short, short, short week, short podcast. <laughs> yeah, I think we just concisely covered the disaster. And we'll be writing, of course, about it in much more depth, nj.com slash Giants. Appreciate everybody reading. Uh, and certainly appreciate all y'all listening here. Uh, what's your pick for this week, Bob? Ooh, I don't see it being pretty, Daryl. I really don't see it being pretty. Um, I'm going to pick the Dolphins 31, Giants 17. And you know whose name we didn't mention at all because it's almost like, you know, it was given that he was out. It was Saquon Barkley. <laughs> So they obviously, I mean, it goes without saying they miss him. I mean, they don't have any Andrew Thomas, they don't have Saquon Barkley. You know the offense is going to struggle, but you got to do more than score three points. You got to block for your quarterback. And 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 I understand that it's not ideal that your center, your rookie center gets hurt on the tush push play and all that. But you get the threshold's got to be higher than three points. And so we'll see if Saquon Barkley comes back this week. Maybe. I don't know. It seems like Andrew Thomas is still a little bit away. I think your pick is reasonable because of the attrition they're dealing with on offense, especially on the line. I'm going to go and and look, they're searching on defense against this powerful Dolphins offense and Tyreek Hill. I'm going to go 34 for the Dolphins and say 10 for the Giants. It's going to be ugly. I mean, the bottom line is, you know, you're not winning a game when your offense scores three points. I don't care what your defense does. I mean, unless your defense holds them to two or zero, you know, you're not winning the game. And so, yeah. That's and your defense wouldn't even be holding them to two because that would be a safety. But um, yeah, I I just I, uh, I I don't see a way for the Giants to win this game, and it's going to get it's going to get uglier before it gets better, even if it ever does get better. Yeah, I mean the one thing too is that, that I've you know noticed as the season's going on here is the, the, the schedule um, that we thought would soften some. Maybe not as much as we thought. You know, the, the, the commanders are not going to be a picnic for this offensive line, a, a really good defensive line. And then the Jets, a really good defensive line. Uh, you know, and then they go to the Raiders, who knows, when you're on the road and, then, you know, going to the West Coast. And then at the Cowboys. I mean, uh, it, 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 at one point you thought that things were going to soften up some. And uh, how, how odd is this? Maybe the softest game in the next however – Eight eight nine weeks is the Patriots. <laughs> yeah, sure looks I that way. <laughs> sure looks that way. And so the Giants dealing with just a just a whole soup of disaster here between the attrition and the injuries, and they're piling up, and the performance just not being enough to overcome those injuries. And your quarterback, you know, who we just give eighty two million dollars to over the course of two years. And let's be honest, if he stinks this year and stinks next year, he's out the door. Um, 
is not doing enough to elevate the players around him, but also being pressured 46, 47 percent of the time is going to be a recipe for disaster for any quarterback. It's just so many problems. You got to Brian Dable uh, right now correctly screaming at the you know Daniel Jones when he makes a, a ridiculous throw, locking in, of course, on Paris Campbell on the pick six, not seeing wide open Darren Waller in the end zone. I just, you know, look, we could go on and on about all the problems, but that's where they're at right now. And that's where we see things going in Miami. Um, the Giants backs are against the wall. They need their leaders. Uh, and I wrote a little something on Dory Jackson for this morning where he talked about this. Um, the players need to take ownership and all that. But I think that's one thing to say that. And it's a nice sentiment, but it comes down to availability, who you have out there and the ability of the guys out there to, you know, execute better than the, than the talent across the the, the, feet, the the line or whatever. So anyway, appreciate everyone listening. Be sure to like, rate, review, subscribe on um, your podcasting platforms. And we will catch up with you next week back on the normal schedule here for the next little bit with a Sunday game in Miami, then the Sunday night game in Buffalo. But first up, Giants, Dolphins. And I mean, if this was a must win against Seattle, what do you a must must win? I don't know. But we'll, everybody have a good week. And we will talk to you all soon.